So welcome everybody. Uh, here at GAC Family, it's really our goal to bring you a variety of different recommendations and entertainment and insight into really things that we see along the way. And uh, we have a great story and a couple of great people here to talk about uh, this with. Uh, everyone knows Jen Lilly. Jen, welcome. Uh, Thank you you're so here co-hosting this uh, with me. Yes. And uh, we are just so proud here to have uh, Micah McKelvin with us, who is uh, a, an author of a new book called Dying with Purpose and is uh, just in so many ways. And it's it's a wonderful book that we'll get into in, in a couple of minutes. But uh, Micah, it is a privilege to know you and uh, you're just such a good person and stand for so many great things. And your journey is incredible. So I'm honored to be to on delve into that with you. A privilege to be here today. Yeah. I'm well, so excited. Thanks, uh, thanks for spending the time. Uh, so uh, I hope you had a Merry Christmas. Uh, Jen, anything, uh, anything new to share? How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Um, and I'm excited for the new year and all the new things to come with GAC. And I'm really excited to be chatting with Micah. Uh, I was just telling Micah before we started, I actually read this book. I have about seven pages left, to be completely honest, but it's really fantastic, and um, it's a really easy read. You know, I'm a mom of three toddlers, and I'm pregnant, so I don't have a lot of time to read, and I did it. <laughs> so if I can Yeah, read you know, that's one of the things that strikes me about the book, Micah, that you don't go on for 350, 400 pages just trying to create and embellish a story and tell the same scene over and over and over. This book moves, it's a page turner. You read You read through every event in your life and how God has just blessed you and the people really that you've run into and his mission for you. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of work. Thank you. It's been a, it's been a um, amazing journey to be on and God's doing a lot of great things. I'm just privileged to be a part of it. So, uh, so then we'll uh, jump right in if, if we could. Uh, you mentioned life can be a puzzle, which is, is just so true. And at the start of the book, you know, you, you talk about that, that you never know what you're meant to, why, why you're placed here and what the situations that you're put in, what the ultimate outcome and, and purpose is. Uh, but maybe you could share a little bit about that with us. Yeah, you know, as we're all we're all created. None of us were the creator, and so with uh, because we are created beings, we have natural limitations, and we don't know all, we don't see all, um, um, and and yet God has made us on purpose. He's uh, made us for purpose. He's designed us to make a difference. We matter, and yet as we as we kind of navigate life, uh, we can experience uh, tragedy, challenge, adversity, and it can feel like at times. It can feel like it's random. It can feel like it doesn't fit. It can feel um, like we're just totally um, going in the wrong direction and we can't pull it together. I think just the reminder that there is a sovereign God um, who is working all things together um, that ultimately sees the big picture. He sees how it comes out in the end. Um, for me, um, recalibrating um, to the one who sees all and actually has a, a picture that he's painting and, and being reminded of that in the middle of hardship and challenge in particular uh, is very comforting. Um, and it's, it, it helps uh, to, to, to recenter ourselves. Yeah. And, and so uh, for those who haven't read the book, you know, you're, you are a world-class athlete and so many ways just on your way to stardom. And I'd like to jump to the, the turning point, really, the accident that you had uh, in the water one day. If you could tell that story, that would be, I think, great. Yeah, to your point, I had, a, uh, I had high aspirations. I'd, I'd like to say I wanted to be on ESPN and nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong uh, having limelight. Uh, but for me, the limelight, the, the desire for fame was all about me, my gain, my glory, my ends. And, um, and that all changed um, on a tragic turn of events. Uh, I was uh, found face down in a slack pool of water uh, five minutes after I had dove into a wave uh, where I'd shattered five ver four vertebrae in my neck and, and drowned. And so um, the direction of life shifted dramatically uh, when life ended. 
Uh, and for me, it took dying to ultimately come alive to the fact that God had a plan and a purpose all along. Uh, and my vision for my life was too small. Uh, it, you know, living for oneself and all about me is, is way too small of a vision. There was so much more that God wanted to do, but I'm hard headed and I had to be woken up dramatically. So. Well, I mean, you know, both you and Chad, you know, you give so much back. I mean, you've, you've, your whole life is about giving back. And Jan, in so many ways, yours is too. I would think there'd be a lot of similarities, Jan, as you read the book that you could see between yourself and, and, uh, and Micah's work. I mean, I have not had the tragedy of dying and being paralyzed from the neck down and having to rehabilitate. Um, that was amazing. But yeah, as far as always having God and um, his love for people at the forefront of my mind, that's definitely something that we share and uh, something that is exciting to have at the forefront of your mind, because then when you have that perspective, you're always like, okay, God, what next? You know, you don't know how big he's going to go because there is, there are no limitations with God. Um, and so that's really exciting to, to see where your life takes you and, and who your life takes you to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Micah, so you, if you could tell us a little bit more about your journey through Alaska and through your recognition of the underprivileged and people of color and some of the injustice in the world overall. And, you know, I think that that uh, anybody with a conscience, it, there are days when you just, it's very difficult to rationalize and, and to understand, but uh, we'd love to hear more about your journey there. Yeah, I think I think the, um, the, the breaking my neck in, in, and finding myself, uh, you know, moving from an aspiring athlete to a quadriplegic, struggling with um, a new kind of brokenness and a new kind of need and a realization of, of, of dependence on others, dependence on God, really it, it created a fertile soil um, inside my heart um, for, for really good things to grow. Um, and some things had to be um, some things had to be killed off before new growth came forward. And so, uh, getting to getting to some of the things that you spoke about, um, because you know I was used to being the kid that's walking down the hall that was the popular kid that people uh, you know looked at and, and looked up to, and and after breaking my neck and 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 going through several years of rehab and being in the hospital for several months and the, the uh, I was quadriplegic for an extended period and just my I mean I came out a shell of a man you know I, I was um, uh, I still have paralysis today but uh, about thirty percent of my left arm about forty percent of my right arm but I was used to um, being you know strong and confident and quarterback and free safety and pitcher and shortstop and point guard. And we moved to a new school and I'm a nobody who can't, I can't hardly feed myself. I can't hardly hold the tray uh, without spilling it from the lunch line to the table and all the insecurities of what I looked like and being made fun of and picked on and bullied. God really used that in time to help me better relate to um, the broken, the marginalized, uh, those in our world that are often overlooked. And the reality is, is for me, there was a just, I, I saw people that were like me, that were popular, that were athletic, that, you know, were in the limelight. I didn't see amazing, beautiful people that were all around me that were just maybe different or marginalized for whatever reason by society. And so in short, um, by God breaking me and helping me come to a place where my eyes were open, I started to see for the first time. And I started to see a world of need around me. And, and then when I began to see that in time, it became, what am I supposed to do with that? And if you give me back more, God, if you give me more life, if you give me more mobility, if you give me platform, uh, my commitment is to use that instead of for my gain and my glory, for the good of others and the glory of God. And so uh, that's, that's where we've been trying to steer things the last few years since then. So. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, just adjusting your motivation. And, and again, the, in the book, you know, Light for the Lost, I think, you know, in so many ways, that's just such a, a, a poignant way to express, express your experience and then what's contained in the book, because it really does reaffirm so and, and provides faith to maybe those who, 
you know, are, are already connected and already are, you know, part of the, the found uh, that is not only compelling, but just so inspirational. Mm. And, and so, you know, adjusting that motivation and yet you keeping your skill yet utilizing it in a different way. And again, Jen, you know, that's something that you do incredibly well, that you're so skilled in so many areas and yet you take that skill and then you use it for the greater good with children, especially and underprivileged children. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I just, I personally just have so much respect for that from both of you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Michael, you talked a little bit too about an arrogance that, you know, you kind of had striking out 15, uh, players in a, in a 18 out of eight, 15 out of 18 in a, in a high school game. And, you know, you were, and, and having met you, you're a physical specimen still to this day in terms of just, you know, you're, you're clearly, uh, you have all the gifts that would have gotten you to, to any level really. Uh, do you ever look at that and, and think, boy, there has to be a moment where you think, well, what if, uh, when you're watching, do you still watch sports and do you still, are you I, still a fan? I do. And, uh, have a number of, of friends that, that play in the NFL or play in different spaces and I think initially I spent a lot of time focusing on what I lost. I would dream about being back on the court or, you know, back throwing passes. And I, and there was a lot of regret tied to that, but in time I began to um, shift focus and God helped me see all that I had left um, in, in, in life, in my, in my bones and breath in my lungs. And this whole idea of, of you use what you have. Um, and, and, and in time, the focus just became, you know, no matter what would have been, um, there's an opportunity to write a new story, write a new chapter, and I'm going to take what I have been given and seek to to leverage that to the best of my ability uh, for things that will matter when I when I'm when I'm gone. But yeah, absolutely, a love ball. Um, there was a whole season of of regret uh, there, um, and yet I still, uh, by God's grace sounds crazy, but I still ended up downstream getting to play college soccer and did get a taste of playing at that level. But it, it was just a totally different mindset now. I mean, so the way I looked at it was I was going to be on ESPN, right? I was going to be a light-skinned Deion Sanders, you know, primetime plus one. Yeah, 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 right. I'm, I, you know, who knows? I may have made AAA nothing. I, I may have never, you know, made it there. But it, it, eventually, it's like, who cares? Um, he's given me what he has today and it's all for the good of others and, and for his glory. And so I'm going to just, you know, ride that wave. That's amazing. You just mentioned soccer and I um, want to ask because that struck me as such an amazing thing that you started playing soccer because you said it's like the universal kind of language among all nations. I talk a little bit about that. Yes. So glo well, globally, um, if you look at participation in sports, it's the second uh, soccer is number one. Football is the world calls it is number one by a long shot. Um, the, the second closest is actually racing, believe it or not. So the combination of Indy, NASCAR and whatnot. So when you get into the American context, and we think about the NFL, football, baseball, those are actually way down the totem pole. And so, um, so sport is a universal language. It's a way to connect with people of all cultures. And then there's some sport like football or soccer, yeah, um, which is again, football globally, soccer. If you can play that game, you are connecting culturally with people immediately, even if you can't speak to them. And so I began to see over time, um, if I wanted to um, find ways to connect with people and, and serve alongside others and serve, uh, serve people effectively in their cultural context. It was really for me to embrace what was uh, culturally relevant um, to most of the world versus um, asking everybody to come my way. Yeah, I love that. That is great. Uh Living in your car was an experience that you told me about before I even read the book. <laughs> and Jen, I think we talked about before that's that left an impression on you for sure as well. Definitely. 
I also uh, love the description in your book about <laughs> five rooms of your car. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, the, ultimately, there was a, a year and eight months uh, that I was basically homeless living in the car. So no, no uh, storage unit, no rental, um, you know, no, no home, nothing like that. Um, and one of those years, uh, my brand new bride, you know, who is my best friend, who said she wanted to be a part of this, this mission, this journey, she said yes to me and the car, right? And so um, the first eight months, um, you know, I was showering and sleep. Uh, I was showering in uh, creeks and streams. Um, I was sleeping under bridges. Uh, you know, we'd sleep under guard towers on the beach. Um, you know, just doing anything to maximize every dollar uh, for the mission that we were trying to start. Uh, but the real miracle is this beautiful, sweet girl. Uh, she loved the mission so much. I, I, I always tell people she married me for mission. She loved the work and she loved the mission so much. She said, look, I'm willing to, I'm willing for my first year of marriage to be, to, to literally live in the car. And so uh, it's been a wild journey. Uh, but for us, it, we were just simply like, once I saw the physical um, need, uh, you know, we work amongst people that are surviving on less than $1 and 90 cents a day the poorest people on planet earth. Once we built those relationships, once our hearts broke, once we connected on the human level, um, their, their problem became our problem. And so the truth of the matter is like the fact that I had a car to live in is a big deal. Um, and so we, it was, it, it was our honor. It was our privilege. It was what was needed at the beginning of the starting of the ministry. And, and we didn't, we don't see it as sacrifice. It was a privilege to, to, to have a car to, to sleep in, to live in, and, um, and it was necessary at the beginning of the ministry, but fortunately we do have a house now. So we're thankful for that. So. <laughs> That's so good. I love that because I think that so many times, um, you know, I think both of you know this, and I think anyone watching knows this people feel, I want to be, uh, you know, metaphorical paralyzed, metaphorically paralyzed. Mm -hmm. They don't know where to start. They feel like, um, they don't understand that they were born on purpose and for a purpose. And I love that your dad said that because I always say that to people. Um, they don't know where to start and they think, well, who am I? You know, I'm just, I live in my car or I, you know, experienced this. So I can't, therefore I can't do anything because I don't have something to offer. And that was one of my favorite things about your book and your testimony is just that God took you from such uh, human glory, things that we glorify in our society. And he was just like, I have to break you so hard. <laughs> and, you know, and you're like, it was an honor to live in my car. And I love that because that's the posture that we should take, you know, and it's just incredible. So anyone listening, I would encourage you that if you have a heart or a passion for something, um, just know that, like we said at the very beginning, I mean, it is a puzzle and you don't know where you are in the picture, but God will really piece it together as long as you keep having a focus of humility and, and servanthood. And so that's a great word, Jen. It's a great word. Yeah. And dedication to, you know, to, to the underserved and the, the just the, it's, it's really just remarkable. Bill, I do got to tell you this, because this is kind of comical. Um, when we say live in the car, like it's like legit, like, as you know, it, you read the book, but like many times I wouldn't have a place to shower or get ready. And maybe I would get lucky and land a meeting with somebody of your caliber and I, I need to go into a CEO's office, but I'm literally, I've literally just slept in the van down by the river and I can't let, I don't, I couldn't let anybody know that, you know? So, so I would, I would have these shower shorts. There were these Adidas uh, little dry fit type of shorts. I would jump into the lake and I apologize in advance for what I'm about to say, but I would jump in the lake and then I would get pert plus and I would soap up and I jump back into the lake. I hope I didn't kill too many fish. And then I would come out and then I would get dressed and then I would comb my hair um, and then I would go down to a Staples and I'd print one, um, I'd buy one folder and print enough material that would represent one, you know, collateral package. And then I'd walk into someone like yours office and I'd say, sir, I want to tell you, or ma'am, I want to tell you why I believe you should invest in this ministry because we're going to transform thousands hundreds of thousands of lives one day in africa and the reality is is i was literally the guy sleeping in, in the van down by the river so it's amazing to see where god has taken it today but to 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 bridge what the two of you said it was a mixture of um hey god had to break me more 
Um, and there was also a drivenness of like, he's put something in our heart and we're willing to put it all on the line. Um, yeah. Cause I came back from that ex initial experience in Africa and I dropped out of school and I moved into my car and it was, it was make or break. But what I knew is, is I was going to give everything. And God used that over time um, to not only begin to build a ministry, but also to create character. And, and it's important for us today. And talk about why your ministry is called Vapor Ministries. Yes. So uh, two things. Uh, one, um, as we referenced earlier, I actually did, I technically clinically died. So I was actually found um, in the water um, after being in the water for five to seven minutes, no heartbeat, no pulse, no body functions. And I learned very personally that life is like a mist, like a vapor. Um, the second reason is I actually begin to see um, in the scriptures, in the Bible, these different places where God would talk about the reality of life being like a vapor. Um, one you have in James where he says that he says, you, you say you're going to go do business in this town or that town next year. And he said, what you should say is if the Lord wills for what's your life, it's like a vapor. And then he also uses that same imagery in Psalm 39, four through seven, where he's trying to help us understand how short our lives are. And he, he, he gets at it seven different ways and he ends it with what is your life, but it's like a vapor. And so, yeah, so life is incredibly short. Um, people are suffering in extreme poverty and their life, their life, uh, uh, life spans are even shorter. In some cases, life expectancy in the forties. And so there's a sense of urgency for us. Let's get the physical and spiritual care with our short lives that can help people eternally and help people in this life. And let's do it with a sense of urgency. And I want to jump on that and say also to you, Micah, it's something that's been really encouraging to me when I was reading your book and for anyone watching is that um, I once heard somebody say, the good news is, you know, if this is to like for believers who are listening, so many times our prayer as Christians is like, oh, God, give me more of your Holy Spirit. Like, give me more of you. I'm desperate for you, Lord. But the good news is, is that you can't get any more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can only get more of you. And I look at your life and I'm just like, man, Lord, pour me out in a way that gives like take more of me, God, because we all have things we all have, whether it's an overt sin or something that's hidden deep in our spirits that like needs to break off you know we can always get more of the holy spirit uh, the holy spirit can always get more of us and um with life being like a vapor i think it's exciting because you know this is for again like all the believers watching um and anyone who's not a believer i encourage you to get uh find out more about jesus because when you really encounter the love of jesus and not religion it really is transformative but i mean something that i always keep at the forefront of my mind is is investment and not like in a monetary sense and in just the fact that life is a vapor and I don't necessarily need a new deck on the back of my house. I want a new deck on the back of my house, but for that same money, I can build like five churches in India. Mm. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's just, just I, an investment. I love, I love that you use the term investment because that was a critical thing for me because waking up in ICU and in, in being on, you know, my deathbed and all that type of stuff. What it did was it brought me to a crossroads. Uh, and at that crossroads, the reality that life was a vapor was solidified. And it is short, I am mortal. But the crossroads ultimately had two paths. Uh, and I could, I could waste my vapor or I could invest my vapor. And waste it was my gain, my glory. That's very short-sighted because that's 70 or 80 years of stuff and fame and stuff on the wall that will not matter the moment I'm, I'm gone. And I will actually regret it. Invest it was the good of others, the glory of God, the spiritual and physical needs of others. And that will have an eternal um, ongoing value that makes sense. And so the, 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 the idea became, okay, I can't change that life's a vapor at the end of the day, but what I can change is whether I waste it, invest it. And so what is the time, talent, treasure, influence that has been entrusted to me? And how do I leverage it and use it um for things that will matter forever um so i love that i love that uh attentiveness you have towards that idea of let's invest it let's pay it forward well both of you do that in such a compelling way that i want to kick myself for not being more <laughs> like you are and and jen maybe if both of you could tell the the anyone who's watching about your individual efforts here jen in tulsa and micah in alabama Sure. Um, well, I'm, gosh, 
I don't have the pitch. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. My, but, well, I'm not, uh, but uh, you know, I, people should know because it's inspirational and it, it challenges all of us. If you, with your schedule, can find time to do what you do, then all of us should be more cognizant of carving out parts of their life to, to give back. Thanks, Bill. Um, I mean, my main kind of thing that I'm known for as far as giving back is, um, I mean, it, it is, again, it's my honor, like you said, Micah, I, you know, and you tr I truly mean that. It's my honor and my joy and my greatest um, thing that I've done is I'm a foster and adoptive parent, and I'm really passionate about um, just all of the, the tragedy, um, uh, the people that, you know, are in prison, a lot of them came, 72% came from foster care. 97%, 98% of our human trafficking victims came from foster care. 50% um, of our homeless population came from foster care. So I'm really passionate about um, helping children as children, especially here in the United States. I mean, all over the world, but especially here in the United States, because so many people overlook them or think that that's their problem, you know, and that's what you always find. It's always, it's always my, my life and then them. And, and, it, and it's all of us, you know, we're all here for a reason. And um, so I like to look toward that brokenness and just know that you really can rehabilitate a child with love. Um, and recently I had the honor of helping open the first Tulsa Girls Home um, with the goal of getting girls therapeutic healing um, group homes that do bring the love of Jesus into the conversation. Uh, we're going to try to form them all over the country, but we've just started to, we just closed on our first house in Tulsa. So that's exciting. Amazing. Absolutely. That's amazing. incredible. That is and awesome. It really is great. And uh, Micah? Yeah. So the work that um, ultimately came out of the tragedy, the purpose that came out of the trial uh, for us is going into extreme poverty and meeting needs, feeding souls, and elevating God. So when we talk about meeting needs, it's poverty alleviation, food, water, education, and health services. Uh, and when we talk about feeding souls, it's advancing the gospel, it's making disciples. So uh, we actually have a social, spiritual, and economic impact model where we go and we buy property in extreme poverty, develop local indigenous people, and then provide um, social, spiritual, and economic um, outreach that is, it, that is currently impacting hundreds of thousands of people on a weekly basis um, and is making a tremendous difference by God's grace through amazing partners, amazing donors, amazing team members uh, that are serving around the world. And one of the things that we love about the model that God has raised up, we have 530 team members globally. It's an indigenously led model. So 400, 480 of our team members are uh, amazing West African, East African, Haitian brothers and sisters who are raised up, empowered, and are, they're the change agents. They're transforming some of the poorest places on planet Earth. Amazing. Amazing. You're both incredible. And uh, it's a privilege to know you and work with you. And I could talk all day, but, uh, but I want to be respectful of your time and uh, just uh, thank you both so much and uh, for for spending the time and it's just something at, at GAC uh, family and media that we're committed to bringing this to audiences and bringing bringing good news for change because so much of the entertainment business is just focused on all the bad and uh, doesn't spotlight enough of people like Jen and the work that you do and, and Micah. Uh, the the amazing uh, things that you do and and again you know uh, this book is uh, to be cherished it's called Dying for Purpose and uh, it's available uh, for uh, on what platforms uh, Micah yeah a Amazon Barnes and Nobles if you go to dyingforpurpose.com uh, you can connect to a link and get it through there as well so and and great thing is is all proceeds uh, go to the ministry so I don't um. I'm, I'm, I'm taken care of. So it's, it's, uh, which is fine to obviously keep funds from your, your book, but all, all purposes, all, all, anything that comes in actually supports the expansion of work amongst the poorest. Awesome. Amazing. And then, you know, again, quick read, but, but it's, it's not a quick read because it makes you stop and think on every page and it's, it's uh, just, just brilliant. So, uh, Thank you so much for spending your time. Jen, thank you so much for, for your time and this big commitment for you. So 
we uh, we're so appreciative. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.